look for somebody who can be your Sherpa, your guide, your journey leader, not specifically through the journey, but I mean, your advisor. Look for somebody whose ethos is somebody that you believe the work has been done on and with them uh, successfully. Find the people who walk in this world with a smoother step, who are the kind of people that you want to be. And trust those individuals to be your guide to where to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Field Tripping. I am totally stoked because today we have an incredibly special guest with us, Keith Ferrazzi, American entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, and an absolute guru in relational and collaborative sciences. And we'll chat with him to find out why he's dedicated 30% of his time to help psychedelic companies grow and much more. So stay tuned. But first, let's get into some news to trip over. First, Harvard, a university with a complex and controversial history involving psychedelics, including our friend Dr. Andrew Weil, is now launching a policy center dubbed the Project on Psychedelics, Law, and Regulation, or POPLAR for short. The Harvard Center will explore five central topics, ethics in research and therapeutics, challenges at the intersection of psychedelics and intellectual property law, opportunities for federal support of psychedelic research, access to psychedelic therapies and equity in emerging psychedelic industries, and the role of psychedelics in healing trauma. And if you want to see my thoughts about having lawyers trying to effectively think through these issues, check out my now reposted tweet on lawyers predicting the future of psychedelics. As a lawyer, I'm allowed to say things like this. Secondly, California's bill to decriminalize psychedelics, known as SB 519, has made it one step farther, passing through the Assembly Public Safety Committee. Scott Weiner, the senator who pushed the bill forward, sees this as a step towards decriminalizing all illegal drugs. Notably, however, ketamine has been removed from the list of psychedelics covered by the bill because of its potential use as a date rape drug. Former police officer and current drug counselor Marty Ribera said hallucinogens can help in some cases, but they can hurt in so many more. I still find it odd that police feel the need to continue to perpetrate these fallacious ideas, which does a disservice to the good they could potentially bring to the world. One day, common sense may in fact rule. Speaking of common sense, if you are thinking about exploring psychedelics on your own, which I would never advise, but know that people have their own path to explore, and you haven't checked out our app Trip, there's no better time to do so. Trip equips you with knowledge and tools about how to make the most of your consciousness expanding experiences, so please check it out. Also excitingly, we have the unique privilege and pleasure to offer exclusive access to East Force's next album, In, through Trip right now. You can download it at tripapp.co. Now, on to our conversation with Keith. As mentioned, Keith is an American entrepreneur and recognized global thought leader in relational and collaborative sciences. His books include Who's Got Your Back and Never Eat Alone, and most recently, Leading Without Authority, which came out last year. As chairman of Ferrazzi Greenlight, he works to identify behaviors that block global organizations from reaching their goals. After his own life-changing experiences, he shifted his priorities to dedicate 30% of his time to psychedelic companies. Keith's mission is to elevate businesses while navigating how to create a world that integrates psychedelics. Keith, thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to Field Tripping. Uh, Ronan, thanks a lot. I'm, I was excited to be here, and I can't wait to see where this conversation goes. Oh, cool. I've got, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this last night, so hopefully it's going to go in a very interesting direction, and frankly, I have absolutely no doubt it will. So to begin, I wanted to say that much like your presentation at Genesis, you should feel welcome to use whatever language you want on this podcast. In fact, the more <laughs> provocative, the better. Okay, Second- great. I promise <laughs> Secondly, I wanted to flag that in your presentation you gave actually at that conference, you outed yourself as a Pittsburgh boy. No word of a lie. When I tell the story of what motivated me to help start Field Trip, I use the archetype of a 
28-year-old Pittsburgh bro. And I said to myself that if psychedelics can be the platform that gets a 28-year-old Pittsburgh bro, who truthfully would rather be caught dead than in a therapist's office, to open up about his emotions and his spirituality, then there's nothing more impactful that I can be doing in this world. And from that impetus, Field Trip was born. So wow, you know, wow, it, wow. Was, that, it was- That's powerful because I, you know, being a, a Pittsburgh steelworking immigrant family roots. Um, I know all of those folks you were talking about and I still look forward to going, I still have a place back in Pittsburgh and right. I always look forward to going back and hanging out with my buddies at the Rathskeller in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. So I will, uh, I'll keep that in mind as we talk. Excellent. How, are, are things evolving there? Do you think, I, I mean, Pittsburgh has evolved. I grew up in Hamilton, which is, you know, just across the, the lake, yeah. so to speak, and also a steel town. Uh, and it's been amazing watching Hamilton evolve as a city. Do you see Pittsburgh evolving in a well, conscious you know, I way? I think there's a misnomer about all of this. I mean, certainly CMU and the self-driving cars and the technology and all of the, all of the things, Pittsburgh as a city uh, has certainly flourished. But that doesn't mean that the unemployed families along the Monongahela aren't still there. And the old people who were, you know, prior uh, hardcore Democrats in, you know, blue collar Democrats who then shifted to being Trump supporters in the last uh, election before last, um, it, there's, a, there's a huge disassociation to the city that it is today because there was an entire population of people left behind. Right. Um, and that has unfortunately not changed. Yeah. That, I mean, that seems to be a pretty significant, at least Western, if not global problem, that the, yeah. the disparity between wealthy <laughs> and self-aware, so to speak, and this is a gross generalization, and uh, the people who are more blue collar and aren't, aren't as able or aren't as willing or aren't as desirous to kind of keep up with the evolution that's happening is certainly becoming more stark. And it's one of the bigger problems I see as, as we continue to evolve as a society. Mm. You know, and actually, I, the way you phrased it is interesting. And I would, you know, what I love about the, the core roots of the, of the blue collar society is the lack of bullshit. Yeah. Just love that. And and that's when, you know, my language and some of the things that I say, my blue, you know, my blue collar roots will certainly show. Um, as you've known, when I've been coaching, you know, your team and some of the folks that I've worked with at, uh, at Field Trip. Yeah. Um, you know, the, one of the challenges, they don't have access to say, the same information. And, and they're unfortunately, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of what they're, what they're fed with in terms of the digestion of information that you and I might have um, more available to us and more open consumers of and curious seekers in a sense of yeah. uh, of information. So I think that's the big difference. I wish I wish both of the communities could get a little bit of a merger, and that's you know presumably what we're maybe here to talk about a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you touched on that. Just the other day, I, I was walking past my house in Toronto. I was walking my dog and two people rode by and one guy rode, riding by had a distinctly Israeli accent. Like I just knew him to be Israeli and, and that's neither here nor there. But he was saying something and he said, they said, blah, 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 right? Like as people often do when they appoint to an authority that they don't fully know, of, like, you know, they say that COVID's going to go away <laughs> or they say, right. And I thought about it for a second and I paused and I'm like, in today's day and age where information is essentially free and totally democratized in, in many respects, you can no longer say they say. There's probably once in a, once in a time when there was you know, standards to media where you could probably trust the content of media coming up to, to some degree um, to say they said or they say. But in these days, in this day and age, you can't do that anymore. You've got to know your source. You've got to fact check yourself. You've got to fact well, check I mean, the look, legitimacy I mean, of the you're, sources. You're, you're right? putting, you're holding the wor world to a standard that doesn't exist. I just, I love what you said. If I could riff on it again, by the way, sure. you're, you're saying all these things. I'm sure is just introductory comments, and I'm diving into them and turning yeah. them into the conversation. But let's Perfect. do it. When you say they say, it's interesting. I don't know that the, the world of information has been democratized. I think it's been ghettoized, in that. We, it's not they say, it's we say. That's the problem. The problem is that we are walking around quoting ourselves and we're quoting subsets of individuals. And part of the issues that I have with the liberal elite 
because I, you know, I was a blue collar Pittsburgh kid that ended up going to Yale University and I became a Republican because it just disgusted me by, you know, what, what, what Democrat was at, um, you know, back in the Reagan era, what Democrat was I- at Yale was a bunch of snot nosed kids that had never worked a day in their lives. And I was yeah. like, this wasn't, this wasn't who we were. Right. And I was more about pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and, 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 and making something of yourself and the American dream. And, 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 and Mona, I guess one of the reason I'm going here is there's this, just this horrible echo chamber and we live in it, unfortunately, Ronan, you and I do. And it's so easy for us. If we're going to make a shift in society, if we're going to change the way the world thinks and works and mental well being becomes a, a thriving space for, for evolution and elevation, then we've got to not just talk to each other. Yeah. Right. We've got to find ways to talk to everybody, which is why you started the company you've started and why you use the Pittsburgh bro, uh, or it was, as we would say in Pittsburgh, Yun's guys, um, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the key. I mean, I've always wanted to make sure that anything that I do is bridged into places that it wouldn't naturally be heard. That, that, that's awesome. Actually, that, that perfectly parlays into the first question I had for you. So I'm, I'm just going to read this one because I wrote it down because I put some thought into it. Um, mm. So in your presentation at Genesis, and again, I'm just pushing, going back to that one, um, you indicated that as, as people, we are less relational today than we were in the past. And, you know, and I think you gave the example of who has Sunday night dinners or if you're Jewish, a Friday night dinner anymore, the number of hands went down significantly. But, uh, and I, I, I'm sure you know Gary Vaynerchuk, but I saw a post from Gary V recently in which he said, kids these days are in fact significantly more social than you and I were at the same age because when we were 12 and had nothing to do, we'd go outside and throw a ball against a wall. As adults, we may not like the way children these days communicate, but that they are the most social generation uh, we've ever seen. In fact, Gary thinks the world uh, any differently, seeing the world any differently will in fact hurt businesses. And I'm curious to know your, your thoughts on that because I don't, I'm not sure that it's actually contradictory to what you were saying in, in terms of relational, but on a high level, yeah. it could be seen as being a, an opposing viewpoint. Yeah. No, I think that, first of all, I love Gary and he's right. Um, the way that we interact is certainly broader and more connected than ever before. And that's what I think Gary was, was speaking to. Um, what I also know, you know, having a, a couple of foster children myself and nephews and nieces, is that the world that they play in isn't as authentic as it once was. Um, they're not themselves as, as I think we once were. They're, they're showing, they're, they're right. presenting uh, who they want the world to see them as. Right. And not that any adolescent doesn't do that to some extent, but you know, my fear is the lack of, of real authenticity and, 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 and a lack of transparency. And one of the things that I've tried to bring into the world of business, as you could comment on again from some of the work that we've done together, um, is vulnerability is a superpower. And, you know, it is at the core of, and I've said this even before I believed it, um, <laughs> you know, I, I've known it to be true. My research has shown the power of vulnerability in opening up relationships and opening up trust and therefore opening up productivity and therefore opening up advancement and offering uh, a network of possibilities to yourself through vulnerability. It's just extraordinary. Even when I was so damn insecure from being a poor kid in Pittsburgh, you know, and going to rich schools that I wasn't willing to embrace it myself, I knew it was true. And my, and my worry for kids today is that vulnerability, you know, and, and I'm starting to see it in some social platforms more than I've seen it in the past. There's many social platforms were organized around you know, being, showing yourself in your best and starting to see glimpses of appreciation, particularly I think the pandemic did this for all of us. It opened up permission to be vulnerable yeah, and it opened up permission for white shoe CEOs of financial services companies to cry in front of their people. Um, you know, and I think that that is a big win for us. And I think it's a big win, you know, for what we hope the medicine's going to do for the world as well. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, I think in many ways psychedelics are the antidote to everything that 
uh, I think social media and the presentation, uh, I think was the word you describe, described or, or the presenting. Uh, Ronan, is, I've, is never, the I've never talked to you about this, um, but how are we thinking about the psychedelics as a brand in terms of the work that we have to do? Um, one of the things you'll see me do when I talk to people about the work that I've done, and, and by, by, by uh, by the way, it happens to be authentic. I always speak to people about my use of plant medicine. Yeah. And that really doesn't intimidate anybody. It, it makes them curious. And then I explain to them the types of plant medicine that I've had the most experiences with, which is ayahuasca and psilocybin, and what that's done for me. And I will begin to then introduce them as a segue from that into MDMA and the power of that and the power of ketamine and the power of that. Uh, in a therapeutic setting with the right guidance, et cetera. And all of a sudden, I'm in a place with them that I've sort of navigated through with them. I always find that when I'm talking to somebody, uh, it, the, the adage I used to say is, if you're going to be a great communicator, you got to learn how to speak French. And it just goes back to my era when I was traveling in Europe. And you know, when you were in Paris, if you didn't try at least, you were screwed. You were just yeah. fucked if you didn't try at least to speak their language. And so one of the things I'm trying to make sure we do in this journey in the world is to make sure that we introduce you and, and like, don't we, we shouldn't, I'm not saying you, we shouldn't be so arrogant as to accept people to adopt our language, to adopt our tone, to adopt our style, our job. We owe them the shortest navigational path to them elevating their consciousness. And I feel like I've got to adopt a different language for that. And anyway, so I don't, I don't generally talk a lot, even though I have a company now called Greenlight Psychedelics, because I am speaking to a community of, of people like yourself, CEOs of psychedelic companies. So I have no problem using that verbiage. But as yeah. we begin to talk to the world, I'm just wondering what you've thought about in terms of branding. That, that's an uh, incredibly fair question. Um, and one I probably haven't thought about enough. I know very early on I had a conversation with Bruce Linton uh, about this, who was very actively, I think, very actively still involved with MindMed. And he was actively encouraging to move away from the word psychedelics. You know, like marijuana got rebranded as cannabis. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, ultimately his goal is that it gets rebranded as cannabinoid medicine. And he's like, we should find something else that like, instead of psychedelics, that we can go from psychedelics to the equivalent of cannabis, and then maybe on to some other form. I've always stuck with the word psychedelic, um, in part because it is provocative, and in part because it, it invites that conversation, right? People know what it is. They know, uh, I think, viscerally what it means uh, when you have a psychedelic experience, even if they've never had one. There's a, enough experience from what's been documented from the 60s and how that's been parlayed into certainly a lot of tropes in society, but it gives people a sense of what a psychedelic experience is going to be like, at least on a, on a visual level. Uh, and usually that's enough to open up a conversation, whether it's very pro or very anti, it's enough to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then I'm a big believer that stigma can't live in the face of data, right? So whatever stigmas you have, data will eventually overcome it, and the data starts to speak for itself. So all we've got to do is sure. really engage I, people. Yeah, you know, you know that there's st no, storytelling and data, and storytelling always wins. All yeah. the research we've ever done in terms of helping organizations be more effective at influencing. I used to be the chief marketing officer of Starwood Hotels. I was the chief marketing officer at Deloitte, at Deloitte for that. Storytelling is is emotional transportation. Data doesn't. Data data works for folks once you've made up your mind. Now you're looking for a justification of why you have made up your mind. Yeah. Um. My anyway. So it's an it's an interesting question in a story. I I feel that um the word look I did this for myself. I wrote a book a number of years ago around networking. It was called Never Eat Alone. It's been the best selling book in the last 50 years on the subject, the best-selling book other than Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I tried to change the word because networking had a usury connotation. Yeah. It had a smarmy passing out business. But, but my version of networking has always been about the deepening of authentic and generous relationships and how do you build a tribe around you no matter where you walk. 
and, and have that tribe open up opportunities that are mutual, generous, and authentic. Um, and that's been the, the core essence of all of my teaching and my leadership work, et cetera. And so I try to ditch the word networking. In fact, if you look at my book, uh, Never Eat Alone, it doesn't have it on the cover. Right. Um, so I just put it out there because I do feel that m- the community that I'm speaking to, which are the CEOs of the most powerful organizations in the world, um, or, you know, take a look at what just happened. I was having dinner with Justin Sue last week. You know, Justin got lost his job in San Francisco uh, because the board, uh, he's a unicorn CEO, yeah. had lost his job because he publicly came out saying that he had done microdosing a year before for a short period of time. And that was the basis by which the board threw him out of the company. Um, so I d- still think we're, we're, we're facing a social stigma that is going to hold us back with some perspective of the, what the brand had with it, you know, free love, anti-war, liberalism, all of those things. By the way, I'm not suggesting any of those things are inherently bad. I'm just saying they were, they were co-branded. And yet the people that we want to move, I, I, and I, I'll give you another quick, for instance, I'm hosting a, a quorum and, and I'm inviting you all as well, but I'm hosting a quorum with a group of CEOs focused on the future of mental well-being. And interestingly enough, they never imagined inviting field trip into the dialogue, right? right? And But now I'm going to make sure that happens, but it's people like you know the CEO of Headspace and CVS, et cetera. And they were really focusing you know, on a very different perspective, and I want to make sure that we make this as part of the dialogue. Um, anyway, it I doesn't matter. Uh, for this audience, I'm sure our branding is just fine for today. <laughs> it, 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 I think it's just fine. And, and there's a couple of questions. First one I, I want to ask is like, what are your thoughts? Like, how, how do you think about branding it? You tried to move away from the word networking. Um, a, were you successful, uh, even if it's not on the cover of the book? Or have you kind of said it still fits? It's still the paradigm people can understand. I just have to revamp how people exactly. imagine the word networking or are you still pretty dis- disciplined on staying away from that word and how do you s- see that parlaying into psychedelics just yeah. gut instinct right now because we don't necessarily have the answers well, I, I think i don't know that the sequitur is i'm not sure it's a non sequitur but i'm not sure it's the right kind of a bridge i'll tell you the both of the answers from a networking perspective i probably did myself a disservice of running away from the brand too far right. because i al- i didn't alienate myself but i I lost the core audience. There's a lot of people out there who are really core, great networkers and they love the term and they embrace the term and they see the value in it. And um, by virtue of not having fostered that community and owned that community, I personally lost a platform that not, look, they all know my book. Every one of them uses it as their Bible, but I never cultivated them. I was never generous to them. I never created a space for them to come together and commune and convene because I didn't want to build the networkers community, I wanted to build a community of people who care deeply about authentic and generous relationships. So I never invited the networkers in. And I think that in the long run, that's damaged me because I didn't, um, and also like that wasn't my brand. I was, my job and always has been is I coach the transformation of teams that transform the world. That's what I do. Whether that's working with the transformation of the world through the work that we did at the World Bank, or whether that's you know General Motors or wherever it happens to be, my job is to transform teams that are transforming the world, and that's why I'm so committed to the space that you're in and the in the industry that you're in because I do see it as you know a opening up a portal for the transformation of the world politically as well as in many other ways. Uh, wouldn't it be amazing? For, and I'm sure everybody always says this, but wouldn't it be amazing if our politicians had to do an ayahuasca journey before getting um, getting into office? Um, so on the branding of psychedelics, I do, listen, I'm going to come across maybe to some of your diehard listeners as um, a bit of a, I don't know if I want to use that word, it sounds it's too um, misogynistic, um, a bit of a, uh, just a just a wuss. I don't, I don't want to come across, I'm going to come across as uh, maybe um, milk toasty on this, okay. but I think we go where they are and bring them to us. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to assume that they're going to speak our language from the beginning. You, you, but I'm people, a change management guy. My right. job is not to be. I'm not a, a. I'm not an ideologue. 
Right. My job is to make shit happen. I go into companies and make shit happen. I help, you know, hundreds of thousands of people adopt a new mindset in order to advance when they have been otherwise stuck for years in a certain way of thinking. I help them bust through their own glass ceilings. Um, that's what I do for a living. So I can't, I, I care about results. Right. I'm not an ideologue that's going to stand on, on verbiage. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, uh, trying to think about how to, how to respond to that. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, I think the purpose of what I'm trying to do, uh, you know, with this podcast, going back to the conversations uh, that we were having a little bit, a little bit ago about, you know, trying to normalize this and, and create the stories yeah. uh, and the narratives. Uh, I think, um, a friend of mine who runs uh, mind cure, Kelsey Ramson talks about how, uh, stories change society data changes policy uh, is, is kind of the, the way it goes. And then that's entirely this platform here. That being said, I also think we need, um, and, and I guess I recognize that the way you insert yourself in this conversation is we need the people who are going to make the maps, you know, create the pathways to enable society and humanity to kind of move forward with this. Um, and, uh, and I was just curious. I mean, obviously you were a very accomplished, thoughtful uh, experienced person in this space. So, um, you know, even though it's not necessarily your specific area of focus, I, I'm sure well, you have a lot of is, and, you know, and, and I don't know what, cause obviously my use of, of plant medicine is an easy branding fallback for me because it happens to be my navigation into the space. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and it, and it does have a brand that's very approachable. You know, I think of plant medicine, I think of, you know, having when I was a kid and, and going out into the woods with my mom and looking for sassafras to make sassafras tea. Um, right. And I mean, it's like, these are things, plant medicines have always been core to, to society and, you know, generations of. Um, so I love that. Now, right. now we're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, laboratory made um, psychedelics that have incredible efficacy. And I'm all I'm saying is that's why I was asking what what brands have you heard or thought of used in the space that don't have the throwback uh, uh, because I'd like to begin I'm I'm opening up by the way I'm new at this because I've I've come into this space by feeling comfortable with things that I can pick from the ground whether that's cannabis or um, or mushrooms or ayahuasca vine. Um, I felt very comfortable navigating into that space. I actually felt much less comfortable personally with um, psychedelics that were laboratory grade. And even friends of mine who have said, oh my gosh, you know, here's this great laboratory grade ayahuasca. Um, I've never tried it. And I know it exists. And I've done 16 ayahuasca sits. Yeah. Um, and I've never tried laboratory grade ayahuasca. So I've got a lot of learning and growth to do. I'm probably exposing myself, uh, you know, with some vulnerability here to your community who's, who are diehard fans. But, um, you know, this is a growth and evolution for me as well. Uh, that's awesome. And thank you for sharing that. I don't think my, my listeners are necessarily diehard fans. I, I think the two people I'm trying to speak to are the people who are open-minded and curious about this, who want to learn more and, you know, the whole reason for the podcast was to give a platform for people who are successful and quote unquote normal, who can be held as a model of someone who's high functioning and, and has his or her shit together, uh, but also incorporates psychedelics or plant medicine yeah. uh, into their lifestyle. Now, I think one of the things that we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with Field Trip is, and I actually was speaking to Corey, our, our VP of our trip app, um, you know, our job is to be the bridge, which is plant medicine is not a conversation that I think resonates, at least presently, with the medical community, with the scientific right. community. And as soon as you drop mm-hmm. plant medicine, they kind of tune out and, and you've kind of lost them. You're right. 100%. One of, the, one of the things we learned from the cannabis industry, and I think we were quite instrumental, certainly in Canada, but also I think around the world in driving adoption of cannabis whether it's therapeutic or purely recreational forward is we spoke the language of the doctors. We did it in a way that doctors could wrap their heads around because if you can get the doctors to shift this way and be like, Oh, okay, I'm okay with cannabis. You know, I'm not comfortable with how it's dosed. It doesn't quite make sense a whole bunch to me, but listen, I see patients having really positive outcomes and it's meaningful to them and that's improving their quality of life. And so even though I don't have the data to support it necessarily or the studies that would enable me to dose it properly, 
I can now get behind it because you spoke my language uh, and I'm on board. So that's part of the conversation. Well, look, I mean, you know, you look at the tipping point there um, with Sanjay Gupta and his work around CBD. Yeah. And I don't know if I should sort of, you've studied this much better than I have, but if I look at the, my instinct, my marketer's instinct said that the credentializing of Sanjay Gupta with CBD and telling the story of Charlotte's web and, you know, epileptic children in Colorado that were being deprived of a, of a, a therapeutic resource that was going to save their lives. It, I mean, it just, it was just so obvious, right? And then that tipping point, then on to the other tipping points, um, you know, and then the, the cancer patient, you know, mom, who's trying to hold her family together and doesn't have access to cannabis as a, you know, it's like that just became so clear. Yeah. Um, and that told that story. Um, you know, I, I love the story, you know, and I don't, I don't have the story personally. But my story is, is a powerful one and I'm looking forward to telling it on this show. But, um, I, you know, I just, the stories of the one I always use and just consistently use is returning vets and PTSD. Right. And what, what tried and true, and I know you're Canadian, but what tried and true American doesn't want to relieve our vets who have given everything um, to relieve our vets from the, from the horrible, horrible, uh, psychological depression and PTSD that they're facing mm -hmm. and that this is a, uh, a magical cure that's available to them and that has data that shows it. I mean, it's just, how can you, how can you not back that up? And to me, that's the, you know, that, that, those are the kind of stories that I like to tell. Uh, absolutely. Similarly, what we're seeing with that's really engaging on, on a social and political level is people facing end of life distress, you know, people who are going to die soon uh, mm -hmm. and they know it and have the terrible anxiety associated with it. It's like, how can you deny these people um, something that'll make that suffering a little bit less, but yeah, yeah, that's perfect. But, but clearly we have these tipping point stories, right? The tipping point stories open up the door and the possibility, because as soon as you've got somebody saying, okay, yes, I agree now, it's it's appropriate and for this use case then the tide is turned yeah and if you get enough of society agreeing in their head cognating a use case then the tide is turned and we've and then we've opened up the possibility i'm i've got to be admit i am shocked by the the potential of what's going on in california right not that i'm not pleased by it but i'm shocked by it um which is the the movement, the speed, and the ubiquity of it? It's not in such a narrow case, mm -hmm. right? The the broad application that you mentioned, and I hadn't realized. Thanks for that update. I knew that the Senate had passed it. I didn't know that it had made a step through the Assembly as well. Yeah, no, I, I, it's massive. I mean, it, that, that was one of the things very early on in 2018 when we started looking into it, and and I started just like putting the dots together of what was happening you know, Michael Pollan and how to change your mind, math being granted breakthrough therapy designation, Peter Thiel investing in Compass, you know, these are all small data points that hadn't quite connected in my head. And the thing that actually tipped me over was seeing that there were a number of online stores openly selling mushrooms in Canada, even though they're illegal. And I realized that the zeitgeist had already changed. You know, we were just trying to catch up to it and trying to stay as ahead of it from a business perspective as much as possible. But that was three years ago now, uh, and and everything's still starting to flow from it. But yeah, I would love yeah. to hear uh, your journey in, into psychedelics. I'd love to hear your journey. Period. How you went from a Pittsburgh kid to Yale to being a CMO of. Uh, Starwood Hotels and, and beyond, and and into the work you're doing and, and elevating teams. So what was your journey to get here? And then, please insert into that conversation if and how psychedelics played a role in that. And yeah. even if they didn't, uh, we'll get into that conversation too. No, they certainly did. Um, but, by the way, the other use case that I just started to think about based on your conversation about end of life, my mom's um, 89 okay. and is doing great physically. But I think she's made a decision that she's surprised she's lived this long. And I think she's making a decision that she probably won't live much longer. Now there's no, there's no medical reason for this, right. right? I have a trainer come to her home three times a week. Um, she drives, she, she has lots of great friends that she goes out and does stuff with, but in her mind, she may not live till 90. There's nothing medical about it. 
And I realized the power of the power of some form of um, intervention in the medicines we're talking about, what that might do for her right. at this stage of her life. I mean, my mom could easily live another 10 years, easily, maybe more. I mean, I plan to live to 120 without a question. My dear friend, Peter Diamandis and Tony Robbins have taught me a lot about longevity and where we're headed with, um, with the human lifespan. And there's no question in my mind that I can live to 120 and still be healthy. Okay. Um, and I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, I would love but, to hear that, but let's and, get into um, that later. Yeah. Tony and, and Peter are coming out with a book on longevity right now. And uh, they've launched a company, which I coach their executive team called Fountain Life. And the real commitment again is to live well into the hundreds. Um, but my point is my mother could live that long. Right. And, but I don't think she'll live that long if there isn't some form of psychological intervention. And it's not going to be getting my mom to see a therapist. It's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough and it might not even happen. But if I could get my mom to partake in some of the medicines we're talking about, I think it can make a massive difference. Um, and that's, you know, straight from Pittsburgh. Uh, what you would, what we could do for her life. Um, sure. How, how does that make you feel though? I mean, the thing that comes well, up castrated, me, first of all, I mean, it makes me feel castrated that I don't know what you meant by that, but castrated that I can't help her. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to use the same coaching techniques that I use on you and your team. Yeah. Um, you've seen. they don't, they don't work with mom. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't like pound on a table and talk about, are we going to be high grade professionals or not here? You right. know, like, but, um, yeah. I mean, wh but what was your question? I, I interrupted when you said, uh, how does it make you feel? What were you, what were you referring to? No, I mean, castrated is a perfect answer, but to me, there's something elegant of a person, you know, we're, I don't think we're biologically programmed to live forever. May maybe I'm wrong. I'm not oh. going to sort of take a position on that. But I think there's something really elegant for someone, uh, and I may piss a lot of people off, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this, someone saying, like, I've lived a good life, and I'm ready to go. You know, I've had my experience. I've come here to do what I've meant to do, and I'm okay with starting to step off. You know, I think there's something really I just, elegant about I, that. I get nauseous hearing that from you. <laughs> so, I mean, Please, explain. I, no, I just, I mean... God put me on this planet along with everybody else. To me, I'm a maximizer. God put me on this planet to make sure that by the time I left, I made the biggest footprint that I possibly could while I was here. That's why, that's why I'm here. And, right. and that's what I wake up for every day. And that's why I know, you know, I, I found a wonderful, wonderful new relationship in this past year, um, which I think you met, right? You met, uh, you met Kale. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you were aware, but, you know, Kale is my significant other. I, I was not aware, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I remember that that got connected subsequently, but it didn't happen, you yeah. know, in a synchronous way that, yeah, you're right. I, I do recall that. Yeah. And, um, and that relationship, um, you know, I wake up every day looking to what I, I created a word for how all relationships should be. And I call it co-elevating. We should all be in relationship with each other going higher. Right. Um, some people have joked, I mean, getting higher, but no, going, <laughs> going higher. Um, the idea that we're all lifting each other up in service of the mission, but at the same time in service of each other. Right. And, you know, and if you're not in a relationship with the love of your life and you're not co-elevating, you need to reassess and, and work on that relationship differently. Our job is to lift each other up. Um, and let me take you back. Um, let me take you back to P Pittsburgh. Sure. And I'll give you a quick chronological. Yeah. Um, try to be as short as I can. But the, the, the long and the short of it is this. Um, born into a uh, very traditional Midwestern dysfunctional immigrant to, uh, family. Um, and I, and I mean that with all the love and respect for my parents who did an extraordinary job of making uh, the path for me something that they never had for themselves. And it was beautiful. Um, that said, <clears throat> you know, you had a certain style of parenting, which was um, uh, psychologically challenging. 
as I'm sure you know many of us. By the way, I have come to the conclusion that the purity, the beautiful. You have, you have kids, Ronan. I do. I have a five year old and two year old. Yeah. So I mean, the the beautiful. So all you've been able to do is fuck that up. You there's like <laughs> you you can't do you can't it can't get any better than when that that beautiful innocence that perfect bliss that was born into your family's life the best thing you could do is just fuck it up less because at some point the disappointment of humanity sets in and i think no matter what every parent will be accused of having fucked up their kids because there's no way we could ever meet the purity and perfection of what they're born into this planet as and i think for the rest of our lives we're just trying to get back to as, to as close to that as is ever possible that's the journey like you mm-hmm. know no matter what has been piled on as shit on top of you all your life. Your journey now is to just keep uncovering and getting back to the purity that is in you. That's what I believe. And then, so my journey from Pittsburgh uh, to today is still the journey of, you know, being that beautiful little pony underneath that pile of shit. And I'm still pretty dirty. Um, and I'm working on it every, every day. I'm going down to Costa Rica for a one week journey with a, with a group that I had become very enamored by called one heart. Um, I found them very early on and it's a group that brings entrepreneurs to, um, uh, to places where, uh, ayahuasca is decriminalized and, um, and does amazing journeys with entrepreneurs. And it's, it's not just the sitting, we'll be sitting three times with the medicine, but, will will also i've been now working with them to design what i call the wraparound services and the wraparound services are all the things that i do for your executive team but now we're doing it for a group of executives right. and more because right. I mean, now i have deeper permission I and mean, there's stuff that i couldn't get away with doing for your group that i learned from 12 steps and aa and others that are very powerful and by the way that's one of the things i love about psychedelics people don't understand that the founders of aa you know, Bill W. and others were big proponents of psychedelics as a cure for alcoholism. Yeah. But it was so controversial at the time because of the brand of psychedelics that it got stomped down. And and addictions, the cure for addictions um, through the path of psychedelics is a massive area that we should be spending more and more time looking at. And I don't know what kind of research, you probably know the research better than I do, but I would love to be put into touch with that because, you know, I have been I've been rife with addictions in my life. Um, thank goodness, not ones that have taken me off the rail or debilitated me, but there are things that made me further away from being that pure essence of that beautiful little child that I, that I have inside of me. So going back then to, uh, uh, to Pittsburgh, you know, like everybody, like every other kid, I, I got fucked up, but at the same time was given a lot of tools mentally and socially by my father. Um, to achieve. And what I really learned as a young kid was that um, nepotism was something that I could create if I wasn't born into it. So I'll explain that. that, So I don't know if you were born into, if you were a rich kid born into a rich family, but if you were, you had somebody helping you. You had somebody creating a safety net. You had somebody giving you introductions and then opportunities and all those things. I never had any of that, but I realized that I didn't have to be born into it to build the relationships that would give me all of those things. So it's the relationship, it's the strength of the relationship that opens doors in nepotism. It's the strength of the relationship that opens doors for those of us who weren't born into that. So I was able to out, I was able to strip out of my economic disparity and into a new world through relationships. Those were the doors that became open to me. And as a result, I had a disproportionate and inordinate amount of success. Um, cause I applied those tools like a motherfucker. Um, and I wrote a book about it in never eat alone. You told me I could swear. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to be bring my Pittsburgh. Um, and so I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I applied those tools, became the youngest officer in a fortune 500. I was, you know, all these wonderful things. Um, and somewhere along the way, I realized that I wasn't happy. Now I fought it because in college I said to myself, you know, I will happy happiness is for yoga instructors, not for real people. Um, I literally would say that the worst thing I ever wanted to be was happy because I was afraid I wouldn't be successful. I literally would say that I didn't want to be happy. 
I was afraid I wouldn't be successful. Um, and the journey, but, but in the back of my head, I knew that was a ridiculous thing to say. Um, but all I knew was the peripatetic way in which I drove and ambition and, and, and constancy. I mean, if you read the book, never eat alone, you'd be like, Whoa, that's, that takes so much energy. Right. Um, and it did, it did, it did take a lot of energy. Um, but it, what caught up to me was I wasn't happy and I was married twice and, um, never as in love as I felt I should have been or as I felt the world deserves to be. Um, I, uh, I cheated and, and, and I was not congruent with my values that I talked about in the work world and other places, um, in my life and my personal life. I, um, I, I was, I wasn't congruent. I wasn't aligned. And, and yet, yeah, sure. I had a lot of success. Um, it was my desire to bring congruence into my life that made me, oh, and by the way, along the way, I realized, well, shit, I'm gay. <laughs> you throw that into the mix. Sure. Um, you know, coming from a poor Catholic Italian upbringing, um, going to, you know, uh, in, in the conservative era of the Reagan era, yeah. you know, just there, when I grew up being successful and being homosexual, I had no alignment. You, there's like, there what the word wasn't even used. There were no CEOs. Barney Frank wasn't even out at the right. time. There was nothing. You couldn't yeah. be any, there's nothing. Um, Liberace was straight. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was no role model. And that just compounded even more shame. And, you know, if you wanted to be successful, you lied. Right. You just lied about who you were. My first uh, uh, husband and partner, Roel, amazing guy I met at Harvard. Um, he was from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I was from the business school. Uh, when, when I was at Deloitte early on, he, he became Rene. I would speak to about my fiance, Rene. Right. And I would just lie. Yeah. And you can't live your life lying and have that not impact you. Right. Um, so, so now you got the, you know, you know, they say, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a pony somewhere in that pile of shit somewhere way underneath that there was a pony and there's a lot of shit. Yeah. Um, and I kept succeeding using the tools that I had learned, but none of those tools aligned to happiness. But then I, then I found therapy. Actually, the first thing I went to was my priest. It was an Anglican priest, actually, at Yale, and um, where I first realized that being gay wasn't an abomination um, because he didn't believe it was, and he taught me that. Okay. And that was a starting point. And then, so my spirituality, my Christianity was the first place that I found uh, a, a pursuit of happiness and a pursuit of the kind of things that I, and I'm so lucky that I found the right spot at the right time. Because there were a lot of religions, of course, that would not have been so comforting to me at the time. Um, and then I started to look at meditation. And I went to a wonderful thing called Vipassana meditation, which if, you, if, if your listeners haven't gone, it's the most extraordinary way. It's the way the, the Buddha taught to uh, meditation. It's 10 days of silence, 10 hours of meditation a day, and it's free. When you're done, you're told how much it costs. And if you have the uh, funds, you pay for the next person to go because somebody has already okay. paid for you and it's all over the world and you should go. Um, if anybody hasn't done a 10 day sit, I would highly recommend it as a part of your healing journey. Um, and I found other things like Tony Robbins when I was a younger man. Now he's a friend. It's always pinched myself. Some of my early icons became friends, Deepak Chopra and others. Um, right. And, uh, you know, landmark forum, the work, the early work of Est, with um, uh, Werner Earhart, who became a mentor of mine, uh, and studying under under him with Landmark is also an amazing. I'm giving you a list of things that I've used in my life to awaken, to elevate. Um, and no question, along the way, there was the calling that this thing was out there, um, which was a journey led by a shaman um, called ayahuasca, 
that somebody said had brought them a lot of um, congruence in their life and started to help them truly unpack. I mean, I've done tons of therapy, but I was really looking at going that, that last, you know, connecting the cable that I knew what to do, connecting the line to the, to the front doorstep to turn the lights on. My lights still weren't on. I knew it all, but it just hadn't sunk in as much. I mean, I was acting as if 12 step programs. Um, Al-Anon is one of the greatest awakenings. The Dalai Lama said of the 12 step programs, it's God's gift to mankind in the last 200 years, greatest gift to mankind in the last 200 years, according to the Dalai Lama is the 12 step programs. And Al-Anon is one where if you're, if you're, uh, addicted to control, which so many of us are, it's, it's the right 12 step program for you. You don't have to have a bona fide addiction. I used to say that anybody with a bona fide addiction was better off than everybody else. Um, because at least they had a place to go to work on it. And the 12 steps are extraordinary. Uh, that's why I wrote, who's got your back. I call it 12 steps for the rest of us. Okay. Um, and, but still having heard about this thing called ayahuasca and, and wanting to go experience that. And when I did for the first time at, and by the way, just to go back, drugs for me had always been anathema. Um, I grew up in the Reagan era. I was a young Republican. I wanted to be president of the United States. Right. I was going to be groomed to be president of the United States. And again, all, albeit for, except for that gay thing that came along and derailed it, I would have yeah. been on my way, you know, without a question to be governor of Pennsylvania and then going beyond. I had the Republican Party embracing me um, to run at the time. And so I didn't even smoke marijuana when I was at Yale. Like I would not do drugs because back in those days, you didn't if you wanted to be in politics. Yeah. Yep. So I, in the back of my head, I had this tape that drugs was not something you would do. So I never experienced it. So the idea of, of, of drugs it just never went there. So I never had my psychedelic fun in college, et cetera, as yep. an opening or a gateway to the stuff. I found it purely as a therapeutic desire to become the man that I wished I could get back to that I never even knew because it was too young that shit started getting piled in my mental psyche. Um, so 16 sits later, um, maybe 20 some psilocybin journeys, um, later, um, only one ketamine journey, uh, okay. although I just signed up for a therapeutic session, uh, again, once I come back from sometime in the later summer. Um, and I think you okay. all have helped influence my desire to experience that medicine. I, I hope um, you're doing that at field trip. Actually, I don't even know where you're based if we're close to you, but I'm uh, in LA. Not, you're, okay. Well, we got a Santa Monica location, so we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what I can say is that I am, I'm for the first time in love in a way that I'm proud of. I can say that I'm a better leader than I've ever hoped that I would be, and I still got a long way to go. Um, I can say that I'm more in my grounded feet when I coach, and there's less of me in the room. And there's really just a focus on others and otherness and what they're trying to achieve and their mission. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy. <laughs> I don't say that very often. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Happy, yeah. How long has it taken you to get to the point where you could say, I'm, I'm happy? Not long. I mean, all my life. I'm 55 next week. Yeah. Um, and the, but my journey in psychedelics started less than, uh, less than five years ago. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Th thank you. Less thank than you for five years. That. I've, I have. Like I said, I'm not a sparkle pony yet. <laughs> I'm, there's a lot of a lot of stuff on me that I'm still looking to work through, work out, work off. Tons, tons, still tons of shame, but not as much as I mean. My last journey in Costa Rica, I physiologically and emotionally shook off so much shame in my life that I think is one of the the core burdens of any of us being our true and our, our best 
representations of God on this planet is is getting rid of shame, which is something that we, we were born with. We, we we adopted that. Thank you for sharing to start. Uh, thank you for the vulnerability. You know, I, I felt it. I'm not going to say I heard it. I felt it when you said I'm happy uh, and, and the resonance of that and, and deeply touched me. And um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. The comment about shame is is one that um, it, it's interesting. So um, your book, uh, Who's Got Your Back? Um, my first awareness with shame, my, my experience with psychedelics. So, I mean, if, if you're worried about my listeners being offended by your relative openness to it and not necessarily committed to an existing paradigm, I'm even less experienced than you, so <laughs> don't worry about that. But my introduction to the concept of shame actually came, uh, I did a guided meditation through uh, a non-physical entity uh, named Lazarus, uh, who gets channeled by this game, guy, guy named Jack. Uh, and it's, it's a meditation where it takes you into a dark house, a uh, scary house, and um, you go and you experience a moment of trauma from your childhood, right? And just at the moment that thing is supposed to happen um someone comes in a friend or somebody comes in pulls you out reminds you that you're no longer that child uh and that you no longer have to accept that shame or that event and they put you back in that space and then whatever happens happens and you put your hand up say if it was you know a parent hitting you and you say no i'm not going to accept that and uh by virtue of doing that you break that cycle of shame uh, on a sort of emotional spiritual level Uh, And after I completed that meditation, one of the things that became conscious to me was how up until that moment in my life, um, I was probably 35 at the time. I had never felt like anyone had ever got my back, ever had my back at all. Like that moment that someone pulled me out and I didn't even recognize who it was, but just the sense of like someone looking out for me and pulling me out, um, was such an awareness of like, oh my God, I've never actually felt what it's like to have someone have my back. It didn't mean that people didn't have my back, which was an important yeah. realization. People did, but I, I couldn't feel it. And, and so the fact that yeah. your book uh, was called, who's got your back, um, touched me. Like it's, it's it speaks deeply because I think that's for many people, um, the first realization of you've got the shame. Like if you can't realize that someone's got your back, because I would bet, most people, there is someone who has your back, right? Whether it's a parent or a sibling or a spouse. Well, do you know that doesn't... 50% of Americans claim that no one has their back? Right. And of those who claim that no one has their back, 60% of them are married. Yeah. So that's unfortunately the data that we're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting to know how much of that is, do people actually not have your back or can you just not let that in? Right. Because I think very often it's, it's that expression the latter. Of, shame. of course, it's the latter. There's so I mean, I, I have been dealing with as I've been out there talking to people about relationships, I've been dealing with wrongheadedness around victimization of relationships, which most people have, which is, you know, the world is is not going to give me what you say that they're going to give me. And my point is perhaps not until you shift your consciousness and what you give the world what you give yourself you know of course we've got to get to the stage where we can have our own backs not to suggest that we're living in a world where we only have our own backs there's a difference between self-preservation um and 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 self-care i mean it's like i'm just saying we've got to have our own backs we've got to be able to and i'm still working on that one right what i can now trust is that other people can't have my back um i'm seeing it in my relationship I'm seeing in friendships, um, you know, simple things, just like it's birthday party I'm having next week. I'm having a birthday party on Saturday and uh, my birthday is on the 14th. I'm having a birthday party on the 10th. And I, my COVID has thrown a bunch of different challenges in the world relative to how I live my social life. And it's been a year since I've really activated my social community in physical ways. This will be my I mean, I've had small gatherings, but I used to do, you know, I used to do 15, 20 people dinners every Friday night in my home and I'd have a staff and I have a wonderful house manager who took care of b- building this community with me and for me. And I would just show up. I wouldn't have to think about anything. 
And now I'm activating for the first time in a year and a half. And my house manager is working somewhere else. Um, wasn't available because I haven't been activating him. And, and so I've been scared of how do I pull this off? I've got a business to run. I've got a new chief of staff that's never done an event before. And I've got to pull together 70 people in a space that has never been activated um, at a different location. Anyway, the long and the short of it is I just woke up this past week after having stressed for two weeks about this and realized, wait a second, I've got friends that if I ask them, will go to, to the ends to help make this extraordinary time. And while we're doing it, it will be fun. But I would never think of asking that, right? That's, I, just, I wouldn't think of asking for help, particularly on something that my brand is supposedly associated with being one of the best in the world around. Right. Um, and I'm, that's the big awakening for me. You know, when you can, you can awaken to that. And, uh, and so, as I said, I still have work to do. I didn't, that wasn't obvious to me at the beginning. Yeah. Also, you know, the fact that you could probably have these 70 people and three cases of beer in an empty space and, it, you know, they're there for you and they're there because they like and love you and each other, presumably. Yeah. And all of those accoutrements yeah. aren't necessary for a great time, right? I think it, it, it actually is just, they're just the cherry on top, but they're, they're not, not, yeah. not the ice cream sundae that you're actually eating. So, um, but thank you that. for sharing that. You know, it's, it's, it's always nice to hear about how people are continuing to do the work and, and, and where their growth lies. And, you know, a lot of, I think what you're working through is stuff that touches me and stuff that I'm working through as well, which is I've got yeah. similar kind of things that I deal with. And, and um, well, listen, and that's, you know, the work we're about, the work we're about to go do together um, will let us get to know each other a lot better. Um, but I, you know, and, and I do hope that it won't be too long until we'll be, breaking bread together in one location um, and, you know, and, and, and extending that even more. Although I do have to say that people use as an excuse, the virtual world that we're living in today as an excuse not to go deep, but really all one needs to do is be more intentional. We just went pretty deep today. We didn't do it mutually. And I, and I feel that I would love to hear your story, your art, your like, you know, I get that, but I know that my job today is to do a certain thing for you and your audience. Um, but the idea of, of grooming and growing, uh, together, I'm looking forward to what I'm going to be learning from you as well. I really do. I mean, you, I've watched you and for your viewers who don't get to see this as a leader, you're a very special man. Um, I've watched your humility. I've watched your vulnerability. I've watched, uh, your presence and how, and, and how heartfelt you are. And it really is extraordinary. And by the way, and Kale echoes that when he first met you and suggested that we connect. Um, so anyway, um, Thank you. you're a special dude and you're, you know, you're doing, you're doing God's work on this planet. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. It really means a lot. It, it, the timing of that statement also is particularly profound because just yesterday and even on Twitter's terrible form to be sharing it you know i'm doing a podcast called the real leaders podcast and and when conrad the, the producer of this podcast sent it to me because he's been coordinating it i stopped and i realized i'm like i've never considered myself an effective leader i've never considered myself a leader it's such an a foreign concept to me that i don't even recognize it um, and so for you to say that uh, is is really touching so so thank you very much yeah. And by the way, you should, you should share that in our next group meeting. Um, because part of the opportunity of leadership and part of the opportunity of relationships and part of the opportunity for all of us as we show up in the world is, can we get to the stage where we can ask others what they think of us and co-create who we want to be from their input? Now, there's a lot of unpacking to do around that because I remember I did that at my last big birthday. Um, so I'm 55. So I guess I did it when I was 50, I threw a big party and I asked, I said, nobody's allowed to bring gifts. The only thing I want you to bring is a note in your birthday card on what you think I could do to be a happier me 10 years from now. And most of them said, lighten the fuck up 
why in the hell are you <laughs> asking a question? I think you're great. Uh, which is, by the way, some of the best answers I got, you know? Um, and so I'm always looking to co-create. The key will be when you do that to have also done the work to make sure that you know that whatever you get back, you're also enough. So while you invite your team to invite you to say, how can you be a better leader? I want you to also know that you're enough at the same time. Those two things are really important. But it doesn't mean that we can't. This day, day and age leadership, I don't think any leader worth their salt must feel that they have to get at least 30% better than they are. The world is too tumultuous. The markets are too tumultuous. The things you're facing are too challenging. If you don't think you need to be at least 30% better than you are as a leader, you're not a good leader. Right. It, it, it's, it's entirely true. Uh, and it's also entirely true that it's hard to think that you're enough at, at the same time. I mean, there are, A, the, the latter thing you're enough, at least for me, is an incredibly hard thing to accept. Um, and then to... You know, counterbalance that or op- oppositionalize that against. You still got to be thirty percent better. You know, it's one of those things that I think you. I, I think you've met. I know, I know you've met because I spoke to him this morning. Uh, my friend Jason Gaynard, who runs Mastermind Talks, because uh, he was talking about the interaction you had. Um, you know, and and finding that balance between being good enough and still wanting to be better. And how do you actually? balance those two and i think it's fundamentally motivated by what's driving it which is are you good enough yes do you want to be better that's fine do you feel you need to be better that's where it gets a little bit more challenging yeah um, but, what did, uh, did he say anything that would be valuable to me in my journey he he just said um you know, because I, I, I actually I made a note here. I'm like, if you haven't met Jason Gaynard, I think you should meet him because I think you guys would just hit it off into the world in a way. And, you know, thinking about a lot of the things you've written about and said and the way Jason, you know, thinks and speaks and, you know, trying to create value and, and create relationships. You know, I, I like to be a connector. I really like to connect people. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was like, oh, I'm going to connect uh, Keith with Jason. But of course, you know, I'm messaging him. You guys had already met. So I kind of left it at that. But uh uh, he he just kind of offered some insights about the interaction where he, I think you mentioned that the statistics about um, you know fifty percent of, of, of people uh, thinking no they no one's got their back um, and sixty percent of them are married. Um, yeah. so. so how do we what have we done for your community today? And in the little bit of time we have left, is there anything more we need to do for the next five minutes or so? Yeah. So I, I was going to ask, which is to make to provide some tangible uh, takeaways, because for me, the, the biggest takeaway is for people to come on here and open up about things that are hard to open up about, because at the end of the day, that's what psychedelics is about in my mind, is like creating that vulnerability. Um, and so it, there's a number of paths to do it. And just listening to these conversations is a big way. But the other thing I want to do is like takeaways, you know, what are some tangible takeaways? So uh, I had one question. I'm going to ask two questions. One was um, someone who I have a lot of respect for was Cameron Harold. I don't know if you've ever met Cameron, but odds are you probably crossed mm-hmm. paths with him at some point. He was the COO for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I remember one of the times I saw him speak, he was talking about his new book, uh, which was Double Double. And he said, you don't have to read the whole thing. You only have to read, you know, here are the two takeaways or three takeaways that you need from the book. And if you want to go a little bit further, read chapter eight and chapter 12, but you don't need to read the rest of it. Um, so I would pose that to you, which is, you know, from leading without authority, uh, from who's got your back and, and never eat alone. What are the key couple of points that if someone's not going to actually read it, but wants to be, wants to take something away from your work and what you do, what, what would be the kind of key bullet points? Yeah. Um, every time you think of a goal you have, I always ask the question, who we get so much time focused on the strategy, the, the objectives, the, you know, how am I going to get there? What do I have to do? Ask the question, who, who do I need to build relationships with to achieve whatever that goal is from love to, um, changing the world in, in, in human consciousness. Um, then figure out a systematic way to build those relationships with those people. And you're going to do it through service of them. Um, 
And if you get all that, and then while you're, while you're doing all of that, show up authentically so that it, it further solidifies the loyalty in that relationship. Um, it's kind of it. I mean, there's a lot of tactics in Never Eat Alone on how you build that broad set of relationships. Yeah. There's a lot of tactics in who's got your back and how you build a team that won't let you fail. There's a lot of tactics in leading without authority and how do you work inside of an organization to get things done in networks that don't report to you. In my new book that's going to be coming out competing in the new work world. Again, a lot of tactics, but it really, you know, I think the biggest gift I can give everybody is the word of co-elevation. If you imagine that everybody you're in relationship with, your desire and your objective is to find ways to co-elevate, go higher together, you'll be a winner. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and one last question, uh, even though I want to stop on that because that's a good place to stop. Um, you, your ask. editors are so good. I'm sure you can swap them. So Yeah, just... <laughs> there you go. Um, for anyone who's just starting to think about psychedelics um, or is starting, you know, having had early experiences or even someone who's advanced, you know, is there any takeaway, any piece of advice that you'd give to them as, as they embark on their journey within psychedelics specifically? So many ways I can answer that question um, with directive advice, but here's what I would say. Um, <clears throat> look for somebody who can be your Sherpa, your guide, your journey leader, not specifically through the journey, but I mean, your advisor. Look for somebody whose ethos is somebody that you believe the work has been done on and with them uh, successfully. Find the people who walk in this world with a smoother step, who are the kind of people that you want to be, and trust those individuals to be your guide to where to go. And then the other thing I would say is, on a personal basis, there is now enough professional support um, in this industry and in this space that I wouldn't go with... Um, I wouldn't go with uh, people who don't have professional cred in, in their guidance. I would wait for the guidance of professionals in this process. That is great advice. Um, and with that, I will extend my sincerest gratitude, Keith, for making your time uh, available to us. Um, you know, uh, I know you're a very busy person busy person i know you've got a lot of important things to do um and it really means a lot that you joined me today uh, to share this wisdom and advice which i think is going to be powerful for uh, everybody who listens so thank you it's uh i guarantee it'll be the it'll be the high, highlight of my day for sure thank you awesome. thank you It's been said that in times of widespread chaos and confusion, it has been the duty of more advanced human beings, artists, scientists, clowns, and philosophers to create order. In times such as ours, however, when there is too much order, too much management, too much programming and control, it becomes the duty of superior men and women to fling their favorite monkey wrenches into the machinery. To relieve their oppression of the human spirit, they must sow doubt and disruption. To me, that's always been the opportunity of leadership. But based on my conversation with Keith, I'm going to be updating that perspective. Maybe the goal of leadership should not be to change the status quo, but simply to change and elevate those around us, and in so doing, change and elevate ourselves. The challenge there, however, lies in helping people recognize their innate leadership capacity. It's something I struggle with to this day. I don't and never have seen myself as a leader. It makes me deeply uncomfortable to refer to myself as a leader. Instead, I prefer to see myself as an artist, though my drawing and painting skills leave much to be desired. For the purpose of an artist in an over-technologized, over-masculinized society is to call the old magic back to life. My guess is that Keith sees himself more as an artist too. To wrap up today's episodes, we wanted to hit on some questions from our listeners in a section we're calling Questions to Trip On. 
This week, we got an email question from Jolly Roger, who asked, who are you dying to have on the podcast and why? Uh, and that is a, an answer I can give quite quickly, and hopefully one day I will actually have something more to say about it. But uh, if you listen to this at any point along the way, you've known that Tom Robbins has certainly been an inspirational voice in, in how I view the world and how I think about a lot of these conversations. So uh, certainly having Tom Robbins on the podcast would be a delight because I'd love to understand his perspectives and worldview in a little bit more depth other than through his writing. That being said, uh, thank you to Michael Kidd, our government relations advisor here at Field Trip. He actually managed to coordinate a conversation between me and Tom, uh, and he and I have been going back and forth through email, and he promised to answer a list of questions uh, for me, which once we have those questions answered, I'm going to read them out and maybe we'll find an actor to play Tom Robbins, because he didn't feel comfortable going on to speak about this, but he's happy to give written answers, so looking forward to providing that. As a quick reminder, you can now record a question for us and we'll play it on the show. It's a great way for us to feel connected to you, our amazing listeners. Listeners. To record your question, go to speakpipe.com slash field tripping, or you can send us questions, comments, or any episode ideas by email to field tripping at castmedia.com. That's cast with a K. Thanks for listening to Field Tripping, a podcast that's dedicated to exploring psychedelic experiences and their ability to affect our lives. I'm your host, Ronan Levy. Until next time, stay curious, breathe properly, and remember, Every day is a field trip if you let it be one. Field tripping is created by Ronan Levy. Our producers are Conrad Page and John Savak. And associate producers are Sharon Bella, Alex Sherman, and Macy Wilson. Special thanks to Cast Media. And of course, many thanks to Keith Ferrazzi for joining me today. To learn more, check out keithferrazzi.com or find him on Instagram under the same name. Finally, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and sign up for our newsletter at fieldtripping.fm or wherever you get your podcasts.